Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Les quiero dar la bienvenida a un video en el cual ustedes van a aprender qué es la literatura apocalíptica. Y vamos a estar aprendiendo de una entrevista que tuve con John Collins, John J. Collins, el autor de Apocalyptic Imagination, An Introduction to Jewish Apocalyptic Literature. Esta es la tercera edición de este libro, que fue también eh, originalmente publicado en 1984, su segunda edición 1998 y su tercera edición 2016 por Hermans. Yo quisiera agradecer a Kerigma, que fue una sugerencia que yo le hice también a ellos, de traducir ese libro. <ríe> y aquí lo tenemos ya. La imaginación apocalíptica. Una introducción a la literatura apocalíptica judía que fue publicado el 2023. Este es el autor número uno o el, la autoridad mundial con respecto al tema. Eh, quisiera que introducirles un poco quién es el profesor Collins. Y estoy leyendo de la Facultad de Teología de la Universidad Yale, allá en Estados Unidos. Profesor Collins, él tiene una licenciatura, en una licenciatura y maestría de University College Dublin, o sea que él es de Irlanda, y tiene un, un PhD de la Universidad de Harvard. Y tiene también una, un doctorado honorario de literatura de College Dublin, University College Dublin. Originario de Irlanda, el profesor Collins fue profesor de Biblia Hebrea en la Universidad de Chicago desde 1991 hasta su llegada a Yale Divinity School en el 2000. Anteriormente enseñó en la Universidad de Notre Dame. Ha publicado numerosas publicaciones sobre temas de apocal apocalipticismo, sabiduría, judaísmo helenístico y los rollos del mar muerto. Sus libros incluyen Los rollos del mar muerto, una biografía, Judaísmo temprano, una descripción general completa. El comentario sobre Daniel en la serie Hermenia, que lo, lo van a oír mencionar en la entrevista. El cetro y la estrella. Los Mesías de los Rollos del Mal Muerto y otra literatura antigua. Apocalipticismo en los Rollos del Mal Muerto. La sabiduría judía en la época helenística. La imaginación apocalíptica, este libro que estamos viendo. Eh, la imaginación apocalíptica entre Atenas y Jerusalén. La identidad judía en la diáspora helenística. Introducción a la Biblia hebrea con C.D. Rom. Justifica la Biblia la violencia. Culto judío y cultura helenística. Y recuerden, estos son libros que están en inglés. Encuentros con la teología bíblica. La Biblia después de Babel. Crítica histórica de una era posmoderna. Rey y Mesías como hijo de Dios, con Adela Jarbo Collins, que es su esposa. Y más allá de la comunidad de Qumran, el movimiento sectario de los rollos del mal muerto. Es coeditor de la enciclopedia del apocalipticismo en tres volúmenes el Diccionario Hermans del Judaísmo Temprano y el Manual de Oxford de los Rollos del Mar Muerto y ha participado en la edición de los Rollos del Mar Muerto. Es editor general de la serie Geo Anchor Bible y aquellos que saben que eh, esa serie de comentarios es de lo máximo que podemos tener en la erudición. Se ha desempeñado como editor de la serie de suplementos Journal for the Study of Judaism, Death's Discoveries y Journal of Biblical Literature, el JBL y como presidente de la Asociación Bíblica Católica y de la Sociedad de Literatura Bíblica, porque él es católico. Tiene un doctor, eh, un doctor en literatura honorario de University College Dublin y un doctor de teología de la Universidad de Zurich. El profesor Collins es miembro del Trombo College. Así que estamos leyendo o vamos a ver a una persona de que en la academia es sumamente respetada se va a él cuando es el tema del, de la literatura apocalíptica. Y como vamos a oír, él es parte de un grupo de personas que en los 70 comenzó a indagar más a fondo con respecto a este tema. Yo les invito a que se queden a oír toda esta entrevista. Va a ser un tiempo muy buen invertido de parte de ustedes para poderse introducir a este mundo. Y en las notas del video van a encontrar el link para poder tanto comprar este libro en español, y si desean lo pueden comprar en inglés también, van a ver el link abajo a Amazon. Es un libro muy recomendable, es una joya en español, 
Y como hemos podido ver, ya va por su tercera edición en inglés. Que decir que es el libro que más se ha editado de este tema. Porque enseña o introduce al estudiante y al interesado a lo que es la literatura apocalíptica judía. Y cómo eso ayuda a nosotros el día de hoy a poder interpretar el texto bíblico. Como ellos lo, enten como ellos lo crearon y como ellos lo hicieron en, en, en su contexto. Como ellos lo entendieron en su contexto. Y como nosotros ahora, el, ahora en, en, el día de, en, el, en el siglo XXI podemos entender estos textos y aplicarlos también a nuestra realidad. Así que les invito a ver las notas del video para, para poder hacerse de esta obra. Y también ver todo el video para así poder ustedes sacar provecho de este conocimiento. Yo estoy muy contento eh, de este privilegio que el doctor Collins me dio, que el profesor Collins me dio después de muchos, muchos meses que hemos estado eh, eh, negociando a qué horas podemos hacer eso. Y eso lo van a ver, lo van a ver en, en el video también, a qué horas estaba yo grabando la entrevista. Pero todo lo hago porque estoy interesado que ustedes aprendan de esto, de este tema que no se habla dentro de los de, 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 de los, um, de los de las filas evangélicas no se entiende mucho dentro de las filas evangélicas y de hablar de estas cosas a muchos les da miedo porque van a oír cosas que nunca han oído o que no han sido jamás expuestos así que ya sin esperar les traigo esta entrevista que les bendiga un like suscríbase al canal y comparta la entrevista para que así otros puedan aprender a qué es la apocalíptica y la literatura judía. Que Dios les bendiga. Once again, Professor Collins, uh, thank you for your uh, for your kindness to give us uh, an interview. Um, the publisher is very um, he's the, the, well, the, he's been asking me <laughs> to 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 get this interview going, and because uh, I believe that uh, according to him and, and to my research is that this is the first time we you are being interviewed to an Spanish speaking audience, and so we're introducing uh, what I have said many many times. Uh, one of the main um, luminaries regarding apocalyptic literature of our day and, and hopefully your book um, the apocalyptic imagination uh, both well, in english as uh, is is on the third edition already uh, so we have translated from the third edition so you, you have your your latest edition available to the spanish speaking readers um, but a question that i did, that now came into my mind actually um, why did you come to the third edition uh, The demand is so great. No, I, I, uh, it's a matter of updating it. Oh, okay. I, actually, at present, uh, the, the publisher asked me uh, to do a fourth edition or a shorter form of it. And I didn't really want to do that. But what I am working on is a little supplementary volume, a oh, small okay. supplementary volume to discuss some issues that have come up. Mm. Now, these are generally a step beyond what's in this book, because mm. this is meant as an introduction. Yes, an introduction, and, and which is so, very long. <laughs> you know, I think, think maybe we should probably stay on the introductory level uh, for okay. this. So, for mm. example, if we start with the question of what is apocalyptic literature? Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, one of the things that has come up is some people then dispute that and then that gets a little bit complicated. And uh, so I think we maybe uh, we, we'll stick with the first level. Yes. So, uh, you know, but a lot of my work on uh, the apocalyptic literature goes back to a project in the 1970s. Uh, that five of us were involved in uh, outlining apocalypse as a genre. It was part of a project on forms and genres of literature. There was one, uh, another project on parables and one on pronouncement texts, and apocalypse was our one. Mm -hmm. What we did at that time was we went through all the literature that gets called apocalyptic and try to decide then how much of that really is coherent. Now, I, to back up one step, why is any literature called apocalyptic? Well, it's because of the last book in the Bible, mm. the Apocalypse of John, and that's called in Greek an apocalypsis, which means revelation. 
But now, not all revelation counts as an apocalypse. So, in practice, what the word means is revelations that are somewhat like what you get in the book of Revelation. Mm. Now, I say somewhat, because you may have considerable variety, but there are certain things that are staples. And what first thing is, it's got to be a revelation. It's not a prophecy. Mm. You know, in the Old Testament, a prophet gets up and says, hear the word of the Lord. Now, you may get an occasional prophetic pronouncement like that in an apocalypse, but mostly what you'll find is that somebody falls asleep and has a vision and an angel has to explain it to him. Or he's taken up out of his body and taken up through the heavens. So it's an extraordinary revelation. Mm. Uh, out of this world. Now, so no, that's one of, yeah. yeah. No, uh, so that's the big uh, difference between apocalyptic and prophetic, as you said. Yes. Yeah. Oh. It, it, that's one big difference. Mm. There are others. Now, then, secondly, the content is also distinctive. And there are two kinds of things that you get in apocalypses. And I distinguish these as two subtypes. Some people would prefer to call them two different genres altogether. But one of them has to do with history. Now, this is very familiar, say, from the book of Daniel. Daniel sees four great beasts coming up out of the sea. And these represent the whole sweep of history from the time of the Babylonian uh, exile forward. And then at the end of that, there is a big judgment. Mm. So very often, the history will be divided into periods. The book of Revelation now doesn't go that far, doesn't, uh, doesn't follow all of that, and that there are reasons for that. But uh, this is the typical thing now in the Jewish apocalypses. History, long sweep of history divided into periods, ending with a judgment. And most crucially, the judgment then is followed by resurrection. Or I should say the resurrection comes first and the resurrection is followed by the judgment. Uh, now, this is the big difference over against prophecy. Mm. You see, most of the, the in the, the Hebrew Bible, you really do not have an expectation of a meaningful afterlife. In the Hebrew Bible, when you die, you go to Sheol. Mm. And Sheol is like a damp basement, you know, and you'd be better off dead, so to speak. But you can't even praise the Lord in Sheol, according mm. to the Old Testament. And it's only in the book of Daniel that you get a resurrection of the dead and then a, a distinguished afterlife where some people are rewarded, some people in effect go to heaven and some people go to hell. And mm. it's in the apocalyptic literature that we first get that idea. So that's the historical type. Then the other type, which you get first of all in the book of Enoch, where he is taken up on a cloud up to heaven, and then an angel escorts him off to get kind of some kind of guided tour of the universe. You can imagine him going around in a helicopter, mm. and he's point all sorts of things are pointed out to him. In some of the later ones, they're taken up then through a numbered series of heavens. You know, in the historical ones, history is divided into periods. In the uh, cosmological ones, the space is divided into different levels, and typically seven heavens, and then God will be up there in the seventh. There are a few variations on that, but that's the typical thing. Also there, one of the main items of interest in what he sees when he goes up into the heavens is what happens to people after they die? Mm. Where do they go? And actually, in some of those apocalypses, and I'm thinking now of ones that are relatively late, say 100 AD or later, uh, often hell is up in one of the heavens. Mm? No. <laughs> you know, hell has actually been transposed. Everything is up there. Mm. So th that's, by and large, the shape of apocalyptic literature. 
No, <clears throat> this wasn't recognized as a separate kind of literature until at the early 1800s. And what happened was, I mean, everybody knew the book of Daniel, but Daniel appears in the Old Testament as a book of prophecy. And the book of Revelation is obviously, to some degree, modeled on Daniel. Beast coming up out of the sea and that kind of thing. Now, uh, but in the, the late uh, 18th century, a Scottish traveler named James Bruce went to Ethiopia. And he got his hands on, apparently, four copies of the books of Enoch, of the book of Enoch in Ethiopic. Now, he put one of those in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. He put one in Paris. One I forget where he put, and he gave one to the Pope. So if you have Protestant friends, you know, be sure to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> that actually wasn't so well publicized mm -hmm. at the time. But now, the one that was uh, taken to Oxford was translated then in, I think it was 1819 to begin with. And, you know, then uh, after a, a little while, people began to take note of this. And a, a German scholar said, you know, it's not only the book of Daniel that's like Revelation. This stuff in the book of Enoch has a lot in common with the two. And mm -hmm. then there was another uh, text known as Fourth Ezra or Second Esdras, which you get in Latin, and you you got you would get in the Vulgate, for example, it, it's preserved. This also is a similar kind of work. Some of the Sibylline oracles, which we may come back to talk to. And so he put together a group of these. And that was really the first time somebody recognized that this is a genre, which is to say it's a kind of literature with recognizably distinct types. And you see, it's enormously important for the New Testament because there is implicit in it a worldview. Now, by a worldview, I mean certain assumptions about time and space. The assumption about time is that time is spread out over the long durée and this can all be foretold because it's really determined in advance how this is going to go. And it will end up with a big judgment. And in terms of space, it is a space where there is a lot more going on in the heavens than there is on earth. Where there are all sorts of angels and demons and, you know, there are... There are layers of heaven up there, and they're all populated. And uh, the goal of life is to get up there. You know, whereas in the Old Testament, the goal of life was to see your children and your children's children. Uh, but that changed. And you see, that change came into Judaism first. Uh, some parts, most of the book of Enoch, in fact, uh, seems to be older than the book of Daniel. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it used to be thought that uh, we know when the book of Daniel in its final edition was written. And, you know, for the benefit of any conservative Protestant friends you may have, it was not written during the Babylonian exile. <laughs> okay. It was clearly written in the, the second century B.C., Mm -hmm. At the time when there was a persecution in Jerusalem, where there was an attempt to suppress the Jewish cult and really to suppress Jewish identity. Uh, that's when Daniel was written. This was about 164. Uh, mm -hmm. We can date it actually, we can maybe talk more about this if you like, as to how we know when it was written. But it's because you have prophecies that are very exact down to a certain point. And then we're not fulfilled beyond that. Mm. And already in antiquity, some people figured out that's actually when it was written. You know, that all the accurate prophecies were written after the fact. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, the rest was, was the projection. But some parts of the book of Enoch are older than that. Some of them may go back to the third century B.C., 
And it turns out, I think, that what led to the rise of this kind of literature was the spread of Hellenistic culture. Mm. And this was, you know, there had been a big series of world empires, as you read in Daniel, you know, with the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and so forth. But the Greeks were different. You know, this was a very different kind of culture, much more technologically advanced, mm. uh, much, uh, much looser attitudes with regard to the body and sex and things like that. And I think uh, the, this Hellenistic culture hit the Middle East much the way Western culture has hit us in modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, something that is quite alien and different. And then people react to that in different ways. Some people may like it and try to acquire it. And a lot of people just react against it and say, hell no, we're going to stick to our traditional ways of doing it. And actually, you know, if you read anything now on post-colonialism, uh, you know that there's always a little bit of both. Mm, yes. You know, that there, there's a theorist named Homi Baba who writes about hybridity. You know, mm. that, uh, even when people are reacting against Hellenistic culture, they pick up parts of it. And, and this is also true still. In like Spanish-speaking people, uh, we always bang the, the Spaniards for conquering us, but uh, we love going to Spain and we love their culture. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's always a mixture in it. So I think that was really the what, what uh, gave the impetus to the rise of this mm. new view of the world. Mm. So where should we go from there? Should we talk oh, more I... about Enoch or about... Um, Actually, um, both Enoch and, and Daniel. If, if, if you if you notice, I put both of them together. And uh, yeah. the 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 dating of Daniel, it's 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 a uh, it's such a fascinating thing. And you know, but Enoch did. We knew of Enoch. Uh, we didn't have that that uh, we didn't have the book. Uh, how did that happen? Because uh, yeah. that's what I understood from what you what you say. We knew about Enoch, but didn't have uh, the text. Well, I mean, we we have. Uh, we have the whole book of Enoch in in Ethiopic. Mm. The Ethiopic was translated from the Greek, which we don't have except for a few small bits of it. And the Greek was probably translated from the Aramaic. Mm. And we didn't have any of the Aramaic until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Okay. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, lo and behold, there were bits of several parts of the book of Enoch. Now, people had already realized uh, long before the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Book of Enoch is really five books put together. Some people thought this was done deliberately to make it kind of like the five books of Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure about that, but there were there are at least five different compositions in it. Like Psalms. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some idea. Now, well, yeah. One of these is a book about the stars, an astronomical book. Most people, to be honest, find it extremely boring. <laughs> mm. You know, but obviously some people were into this. And in fact, you know, it reflects uh, some of the Babylonian ideas about the stars. Uh, it was a little bit out of date, I think, when the astronomical book of Enoch was written. But, you know, when the first thing you think of when you talk about Enoch is the first part of the book, the first 36 chapters, known as the Book of the Watchers. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book of Genesis, uh, you know, in chapter 6, there is a famous episode when the sons of God, and he did, he did have sons, yeah. Uh, looked down and saw the daughters of men and you can guess what happens after that mm. they come down and they 
form liaisons with them and uh, they they explain, they, they disclose certain mysteries to them. They teach people how to work iron. Uh, they teach them how to make jewellery, the art of making up the eyes. And mm. uh, the Book of Enoch says, and there was much fornication. So uh, the, these come down, then the children that they beget are huge. They're giants, and they eat too much, and they spread violence on earth, and in general, you have a mess. Now, you know, this is told in the, the book of Enoch. Uh, you know, this goes far beyond what you have in Genesis. Mm -hmm. you know, Genesis is very short. Genesis is so short that you figure there must have been a longer story. But now whether whether this was the longer story, we don't really know. But the, as developed in the book of Enoch, this becomes the explanation for everything that's wrong with the world. And so then you have a story of how the earth cries out to God and the angels go up to God and say, for God's sake, will you do something about this? Mm -hmm. And so he does and he sends the flood. Now, that act, you know, in Genesis, the flood comes right after these people come down. Uh, but Genesis doesn't say that the flood was punishment for what the, mm. the fallen angels did, whereas that's, that connection is clearly made in the book of Enoch. Now, that, in all probability, is a kind of first run for mm. history, if you like. You know, and it's uh, an allegory for what was going to happen again. I think that probably uh, the story of the fallen angels or the sons of God, that these were a loose allegory for the Greeks. Hmm? You know, not uh, a point by point allegory, but it's describing the kind of culture shock caused by people who come in have much looser attitudes to sexuality and the like, and much more know-how with working metals and making jewelry and all of that. So I think that's really what was going on there. But then uh, after that, Enoch, it, the, the, the watchers call on Enoch to intercede for them. And Enoch, we are told, was a scribe. And which means, in effect, he was a lawyer. <laughs> mm, <yes. laughs> the, the watchers, the fallen angels, tried to hire him as their lawyer. And so he's taken up to heaven. But the, the case doesn't succeed because uh, God tells him, go back and tell the watchers, you had it good. You were in heaven. You could have lived forever. But instead, you were... Uh, attracted by the flesh. Mm. And so, so you know, you gave up heaven for sex. In effect, is what he tells them. And mm. so he goes back and gives them the bad news on that. But then an angel takes him on a tour where he sees all sorts of cosmological cur uh, curiosities, but he also sees the chambers where the souls of the dead are kept. And he sees the place where the fallen angels will be punished. And he sees uh, actually the old Garden of Eden mm. also, which is not really, you know, it th th doesn't explain the problems of the world in the Book of Enoch. Mm. In the Book of Enoch, it's the fallen angels who, who put the world wrong. Yes, I, I, I heard Ed Wright say, say, say that and many others the same, that uh, in uh, in this type of literature, it's not the human sin that, that put us in this predicament, but it was right. uh, the angels. Yeah, yeah. And equally, you don't get out of this predicament just by, by uh, human agency. Mm. You need a heavenly deliverer. Mm. Now, that might be a good point to switch over to the book of Daniel. Okay. Now, you know, the book of Daniel uh, is a very complex book. Uh, part of it, about half of it, is in Aramaic, and the other half in Hebrew. Mm. 
And I think it's obvious that it wasn't all composed at the same time. And the usual breakdown is that more or less the first half of the book, which are the stories about the lion's den and the fiery furnace and all that stuff, that that stuff is older. Mm. And those are traditional stories. As in, in the case of Nebuchadnezzar's madness, we can trace the development of the story a bit because there is a very similar story found at Qumran where it's a different Babylonian king but mm -hmm. uh, and you know uh, we know where this story came from. It was a Babylonian king who left Babylon and went out to tame out in the wilderness, and that's really what prompted this whole story. But then you know it changes as it goes along. Now most of those stories in the first half of Daniel aren't what we would call apocalyptic. Mm. You know they're stories, legends usually culminating in some kind of a mir miracle, like the fiery furnace or the lion's den. The one thing in those chapters that is important for the apocalyptic literature is in chapter two, and that's the famous vision of the statue, of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, which represents four kingdoms. And that at least will be taken up and used in the second half of the book. But then beginning in chapter 7, Daniel, the whole thing kind of changes. You know, up to this point, there are stories about Daniel, and it's after from Daniel 7 on that they begin reporting Daniel's visions. Mm. Even in chapter 2, it's the king who has the vision. And Daniel is called on to explain it. But beginning in chapter 7, it's Daniel who has the vision and he needs an angel to explain it. And, you know, in chapter 2, the four kingdoms are represented by a statue with four metals of declining value, but it's very orderly. Mm -hmm. In chapter 7, there are four great beasts coming up out of the sea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you read Daniel chapter 7 and take it seriously, it's a nightmare. You know, if you put yourself yes. in Daniel's <laughs> position, it's terrifying. And then, you know, the, the fourth beast then is trampling everything with its feet. And uh, that we now recognize as an allusion to the, the Seleucid kings. These were the Greeks in Syria mm. used elephants in warfare. Mm. That's where this image of trampling comes from. Okay, yes that the thought of having war elephants trampling all over you. So, but then in Daniel, the scene changes and he sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. One of the most famous lines in all of scripture. Yes. And uh, now the, the and you know, he comes to the ancient of days. The oddity of this passage if you come to this from the Hebrew Bible, is that before this in the Hebrew Bible, whenever you see somebody riding on the clouds, it is Yahweh, the God of Israel. Mm. Yes. Always. But here, there's another God above him, the Ancient of Days. Now, this is very much like what you have in the old Canaanite myths, where Ael was the venerable ancient god and Baal was the storm god. Now, it's not Baal, obviously, in Daniel, but I think what it turns out to be is the archangel Michael, mm. who is, if you like, the second power in heaven. Mm. You know, the, not a god on a power with the Most High, but not a human being. Now, this is now a controversial issue. We yes. tend to speak about angels and the like. Even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they call what we call angels, they call gods. Mm. So, you know, there are higher gods and lesser gods. And uh, you, you always have lesser gods in the, the Bible. And indeed, uh, you know, in later times too. But certainly in the apocalyptic literature, there are lots of divine beings up there. Some are more divine than others. 
Mm. So, you know, it's not that, not disputing the supremacy of the Supreme God, mm -hmm. but still, uh, in this case, Michael is said to be the prince of Israel, and the prince there means the patron angel. And as the angel explains it to Daniel, the battle that's going on in heaven, the real battle, Mm -hmm. isn't just the one between Greeks and Jews on earth. The real battle is in heaven between the prince of Greece and the prince of Israel. And that at the end of that, Michael will arise. And it's after that then that you get the resurrection. Now, what you do in the meantime? Daniel, we know, was written around the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Mm. And there were different... Uh, schools of thought among the Maccabees, I mean, among the, the Jews of the time, as to how you should react. If a pagan king comes in and disrupts the cult in the temple, what do you do? Well, the Maccabees said, you get your sword. Mm. And then when it turns out that the, the, uh, the Syrians know enough to attack them on the Sabbath, and some people wouldn't fight on the Sabbath, well, tough. So the Maccabees said, we'll fight on the Sabbath. We can break one commandment and stay alive to keep the rest of them. That was the Maccabean way of looking at it. But the way they look at it in the book of Daniel is we are not the ones who are going to defeat the Greeks. It's God and the archangel Michael. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is keep ourselves pure. You know, not make sure we don't participate in pagan sacrifices or the like. And that you need to understand what's going on. And that's what they, they say at the end of Daniel, that, uh, that, that those who are wise will instruct the many. The maskilim, as they're called in Hebrew. And mm. what it means to be wise here means to understand what's really going on, mm. to understand that the real battle is in heaven. And also that this is all under control, that God has already decided how long this can go on. And in one chapter, uh, you know, there's a famous reinterpretation in Daniel chapter 9 of a prophecy of Jeremiah that said that Jerusalem would be desolate for 70 years. Mm. And the angel explains to Daniel, well, actually, it's 70 weeks of years, which is to say 490 years. Yes. But then if you, they, they were a little bit, they weren't very clear on how much time had passed, actually, since the uh, Babylonian exile. And so, uh, but the main point was, you're now in the last half week. And several times in the book of Daniel, it says there will be a time, times, and half a time, which is to mm. say three and a half years. Now, that, uh, and at the end of the book of Daniel, then they actually give specific numbers of days until the end. And they do that twice. And I figured the second time is a slightly higher number. And I figured that was an extension because the first one passed. But Daniel is the only apocalyptic book that tries to do that, mm. that tries to predict when the end will happen, because it never does, at least not yet. Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very interesting, but can you just, uh, to finish on Daniel, can you just, because uh, uh, you mentioned that you know that the dating is uh, around 165, Oh, yeah. Due to, due, to, due to other factors. Can you just, because uh, this is like, in the Spanish speaking community, this is like, uh, and I guess also in the English speaking community, because I know about that. It's a great discussion about it. So. Well, you know, I mean, for, for what I would call critical scholars, mm. this issue was settled a long time ago. Yes. But there were huge battles fought over this in the 19th century. There was a professor at Oxford named Pusey, who was, you know, what we would call a fundamentalist. Mm. 
Uh, he was a learned man, you know, but he just could not believe. Uh, he, he said, if, if this isn't right, then Daniel must have lied on a frightful scale. Mm. And that, I think, is way too simple a way to look at it. But what was recognized, you see, already in antiquity is in, in chapter 11, uh, there is the angel explains to Daniel what is written in the book of truth, as he calls it. That is to say, everything that's now going to happen. And he goes down, he talks about the king of the north, and that's the king of Syria, and the king of the south, and that's the king of Egypt. And uh, then there shall arise in his place, well, first of all, here, it's, it's one, um, in his place shall arise a contemptible person on whom royal majesty has not been conferred. And this mm-hmm. is, it's very transparent that this is Antiochus Epiphanes. Mm. I mean, even people who think that the book that this was written back at the time of the Babylonian exile know that it's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes mm. and what he did in the, the second century. And it goes on with, with his career, you know, and how, uh, you know, he will take action against the Holy Covenant, as he puts it, and some people will fall victim. And then uh, the king will act as he pleases. But then it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him, and it claims that this king will die between the sea and the holy mountain, Hmm. just to say in the land of Israel. And he didn't. Hmm. You know, uh, he didn't. He died off over in Persia. And that, that's how we know, you know, that uh, this was written after the last events that are accurately described in this prophecy and before the prophecy goes off the rails. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then you see what you've got to realize is that this prophecy after the fact was a literary convention. It was a device. It's not fair to say that it was lying. You know, this was a style of writing. It was like fiction. Now, did they all take it literally? That we don't really know. I imagine some people did and some people didn't. Uh, But in any case, I think it's fairly clear that the book of Daniel knows what would happen Mm. In the years 168 and 167, down to uh, down to 164 BC. Now, if you take, uh, you know, as, as uh, some fundamentalists would mm. uh, claim that this was actually all revealed to Daniel, you have to ask yourself then, why did God reveal to Daniel what would happen in a couple of years in the 160s BC? And nothing after that. Mm. Yes. So, <laughs> this, I think, doesn't really make sense. It's like he is talking about the end of history, <laughs> and that's yeah. it. And you went yeah. beyond. So can we say this is that apocalyptic literature is also a, like theologizing history? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. But now, of course, uh, you know, it's expecting the end of history right away. Mm-hmm. There, And this is actually the first case we have of that phenomenon of people really expecting the end and counting the days to it. Mm. And, you know, in every century since then, people have tried to reinterpret Daniel chapter 9 so that yes. it can be fulfilled in their time. The last time I am aware of was about 10 years ago. There was a man in California yes. named Harold Camping. Oh, yes, yes. Who, who set a date. We knew him. This yeah. one was in the 1840s with the, yes. with the Millerites. Yes. And, you know, days come and go. As I say, maybe sometime somebody will actually get it right, but mm. not so far. Well, I, I, I leave. Uh, this goes on for a couple of thousand years. You got to figure 
maybe yes. this isn't the right way to interpret it. Or to approach it. Well, some people would like to make money out of this, out of uh, oh, yes. fear, <laughs> out of fear. Uh, you know, there's a series oh, yeah. of books that yes. have made millions and millions uh, of dollars. Did you ever hear of a book called The Late Great Planet Earth? Yes, it, was, it came out the, the year I was born. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I know about it. Yes. Uh, so the author has that, continued. That went through, I forget how many editions, maybe 13 or 14. Oh, wow. And, you know, he kept updating the prophecy, mm. which it was a very apocalyptic thing to do. Yes, <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> yes, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, as, as in, in Daniel, so uh, in the book of Daniel, the figures, Jerusalem is still desolate, and it's been a lot more than 70 years since the time of Jeremiah. So it must be 70 weeks of years. Mm. So you know if the if the way you understood it doesn't fit, reinterpret it. Yes, and you treat <laughs> these this language as very malleable symbols like that. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's very easy to cop out. Uh, yeah, I didn't get it, I, I didn't get it right this time, but next time I'll do it. Uh, uh, John, uh, can you tell us? Because um, just to move this along, um, uh, there are three types of literatures that you. You, that you discuss your book, uh, Civil and Oracles, the Book of Jubilees, and the Desis Cross. Can you give us uh, a small introduction to each okay. of these uh, leadership? I, I can see we are running low on time. Yes. So I, I'd be very. And, 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 and let me tell you, not because of uh, Professor Collins, it's because of me. I have to go to work. It's, it's sure. uh, yeah. 4, yeah. 4 43 a.m. Yeah. in Australia. And anyway, <laughs> I think, you know, an hour is enough. Yes. And anything. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Civil and Oracles were written in Greek. Now, there are, some of them are properly apocalyptic. They're all loosely related. They're all oracles. You know, they're not visions like you have in Daniel and Enoch. Mm. So they're not apocalyptic revelations in that sense. These are inspired prophecy. The interesting thing about them is they're in the name of the Sibyl. Now, the Sibyl was a figure of Greek mythology a woman, you know, who had asked Apollo for the for, for lasting life, but didn't ask him to stay young. Hmm. And, and so, <laughs> so she, she also has a very dim view of life, perhaps for that reason. Hmm. And a lot of these oracles predict a long sweep of history, often 10 generations or something like that, and some kind of a judgment at the end of it. Uh, not all of them have the resurrection, but the later ones do. Mm -hmm. These, I think, when the Jews took this over, these were mainly Jews in, in Egypt, in Alexandria, who spoke Greek, and they were trying to make, uh, you know, trying to find common ground with the Greeks. So they have elements of what we have in apocalyptic literature. It's not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they become a bit more apocalyptic as you go along. The Book of Jubilees is also a very difficult book to classify because it's really a retelling of the Book of Genesis. Mm. Uh, but this retelling is presented as having been revealed to Moses and Mount Sinai by an angel. So that's kind of like an apocalypse. And then there is one bit in it in chapter 23 that prophesies the end of history and the resurrection. And that also, so you know, it kind of frames its retelling of Genesis in an apocalyptic way. But again, it's not, you know, I mean, you could call it an apocalypse, uh, but it's an unusual apocalypse. Or you could say it's really a book of mixed genre. It depends which way you look at it. It's a very interesting book uh, because, you know, it tells you a lot about the way they were interpreting scripture in the second century BC. But it's not a typical apocalypse. It mm. just has some apocalyptic elements. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, much more important. Mm. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, this was, uh, we had no literature really 
in Hebrew or Aramaic, I mean, practically none. Uh, from the, between the end of the Bible and the rise of the rabbinic literature, almost 400 years later, until the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then, you know, you get fragments of close to a thousand mm. texts. So, you know, huge cornucopia of material. Now, they include fragments of the books of Enoch. And they had copies of Daniel. And they had other uh, books with a figure named Daniel. Mm. So other revelations to Daniel. Uh, but apart from that, they do not, uh, the, the people who collected these scrolls, and we think they were the Essenes, mm. you know, a, a sect, uh, they did not write apocalypses. They had beliefs that were very similar. They had what I would call the apocalyptic worldview. Mm. But they often express that uh, using different kind of mythology. The most famous one is that when God made the world, he gave people two spirits to walk in. How would you know that? Well, presumably somebody would have to reveal it to you, but they don't describe how they got the revelation. Mm -hmm. They just present this as teaching. And then you have two spirits fighting each other, but at an appointed time, God will intervene and destroy the spirit of darkness. And you have this in the, the community rule. You also have it in a text called the War Scroll, which is about the final battle of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. This idea that the world is divided between two equally balanced forces of light and darkness you get that in Zoroastrianism. Mm. Now, you know, the Jews had been subject to the Persians for a couple of hundred years. And even after that, Jews, especially in the Eastern diaspora, would have had contact with them. I don't think it's difficult to see how they would have gotten such ideas. And of course, they weren't just taking over the Persian ideas. They were refashioning them. They were just using the language. But that's what you get in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, also, the, you have a strong belief that, you know, eventually the destiny of the righteous is to be with the angels in heaven. Mm. And at the idea that the wicked will suffer eternal damnation. But you, they do not in the sectarian scrolls, the ones that are clearly written within this movement, they do not talk about resurrection. They do not talk about bodies coming back on earth. That doesn't yeah. seem to be what they had in mind. So, so you know, you have the the scrolls fill out a lot of the um, of the world view of the times. But from a literary point of view, uh, they, they don't give you many apocalypses, and those that they do give you are very fragmentary, mm. which can be very frustrating. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very struck about the civilian oracles because Jews took up certain things from their surroundings and, and yeah. just, uh, and, and the same as, as the apocalypse, as, as, as you mentioned regarding Zoroastrian beliefs, yeah. <clears throat> and they incorporate them and reinterpret them for their own benefit. Yeah. Uh, so, there are a lot of scholars who just can't accept that. Mm. They say Jews wouldn't take over ideas from Persians. And this is nonsense. You know, people take over ideas from all sorts of people. Mm. It doesn't mean you agree with them. Yes. You know, yeah. you're taking the ideas and uh, uh, you use them. Mm. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, the book of Revelation, which uh, let me tell you, I know that your wife has written a lot about it. <laughs> so so you, you're a team. You're a team. Talk, talk, talk quickly. Uh, the, the book of Revelation 
you know, is, I mean, obviously, if you've read Daniel, you immediately recognize a lot of the, the genre of Revelation. So, you know, in this case, the, the difference is that this presupposes the resurrection of Christ. Mm. So Christ is now ascended to heaven. He is the lamb that was slain, but the lamb that was slain is now a lion. Now, this becomes complex because, you know, the bottom line of the book towards the end is that, that this the word comes back from heaven on a white horse with mm. a sword of his mouth for striking down the nations. Yes. And he's nothing like the Jesus, you know, in the Gospels. Mm. You know, he has, Jesus in the Gospels was a nice guy. <laughs> uh, you yes. wouldn't want to cross this guy who comes back on the white horse. Mm. He has undergone a severe character change in the meantime. So, and what has happened actually, you know, is I think that Jesus has been refashioned in the likeness of the kind of Messiah most Jews were expecting, mm. who would be a violent warrior. Now, a lot of the book of Revelation, you see, is reacting to Rome. A lot of it is reacting to the destruction of Jerusalem. So, you know, whether you can even distinguish Jews and Christians in the New Testament period is a controversial issue. Mm. Because the, the Christians, as we call them, were all Jews. <laughs> and the author of Revelation most certainly was uh, a Jew and thought of himself as a Jew. But... You know, he was a Jew who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Yes. And, and this was it. And so it becomes very anti-imperial. But in spite of all of that, there's also a lot of Greek and Roman mythology worked into it and the symbolism. Uh, that's what my wife wrote her dissertation about. Lovely. Combat myth, and especially chapter 12. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's wonderful uh, imagery, wonderful imagistic language. Now, you know, in Daniel, it seems clear that Daniel was telling people, do not go out and join the Maccabees. Mm. And I think also John thought that, you know, if you are to be killed, let yourself be killed. Because if you are killed, then you rise again. And then that's the important thing. And let me mention also that you have written a substantial commentary on the book of Daniel but in the Romania series. So both your wife and yourself have done apocalyptic books, uh, done very substantial uh, commentaries. We have indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it really struck me what you just said. Uh, Daniel is, and then it's um, saying, do not join the Maccabees because, yes, because it's very pacifist. Very pacifist. Yeah. Well, the Maccabees were, were they, they were the guerrilla fighters. Yeah. Well, but you know, I mean, when you say that Revelation is pacifist, it means you're counting on God to do the fighting for you. Mm. Uh, you still want your enemy to get killed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I I don't think this is the way Jesus was thinking about it. Hmm. You know, when Jesus said, love your enemies, mm. well, uh, you, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they say, return evil to no one until the day of vengeance. Mm. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they figured on the day of vengeance, all bets are off, you can join in. I think uh, in Revelation, on the day of vengeance, you just let Jesus do it. Mm. Even though even though we come with him, according to Revelation, he is the one slaying everybody, That's not right. us. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We're just looking at this Jesus, which it's covered in blood. <laughs> yes. Uh, as in Revelation, yeah. which, which is, uh, which we think is because of the, I mean, I've been taught because of the, the sacrifice that he did. Well, actually, he's slaying people, yeah. so he's going <laughs> to. Yeah. But it could be some some other people's blood, too. Yes, yes, uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, I, I think I'll need to let you go to work. Here. No, I, I, one more question, if you may, because yeah. uh, I still have five, five, five more minutes. Um, what about apocalyptic then in the New Testament? 
within the New Testament. Oh, in in yes. the rest of the New Testament, yes. this is a very controversial thing. Yeah, okay. Because uh, in the rest of the New Testament, no, you don't get revelations like you do in John. Mm. But you have Jesus talking, the most controversial thing is when he talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, uh, that's, I think, clearly an allusion to Daniel, at least in most cases. And it is, uh, you know, it's predicting a final judgment. Mm. Now, was that actually what Jesus himself was preaching? And that is the issue on which New Testament scholars split down the middle. Mm. Uh, and now there was a strong movement. Uh, it was a Jesus seminar yes. about 20 years ago uh, that got a lot of publicity. Now, the main people in that just imagine Jesus as a quite modern kind of humanist, you know, who, who wasn't into any of that stuff at all. But then, you know, on the other hand, you have to wonder if if he didn't have any such ideas, why did all his followers get such ideas? Where mm. did they get them? So now, you know, there is, the, the, there is, of course, what I'd call a conservative point of view, which says that Jesus said all those things himself and was thinking of himself. Mm. That, I think, is problematic too. But there is a third way, which is to say that Jesus did talk about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, he may not have said all the sayings that are now reported in the Gospels, but at least that he talked about that. Uh, but he did not at least make clear that he meant himself. Mm. Now, you know, he could have been evasive on it. He could have just talked about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Uh, he, I don't think there's any evidence either that he said, and that's not me. But you see, I figure if Jesus was walking around in Jerusalem, why would anybody think of him as the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven? Mm. To identify Jesus with the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven only makes sense after the resurrection. Okay. And so I think it's not until after the resurrection that that identification is made. Uh, in, the great question brings, though is how much of that was part of the teaching of Jesus. And this is where I'm glad I'm not a New Testament scholar. Uh, <laughs> it, it, makes sense. It, it makes sense when, the, when the, in the book of Acts, the last thing that Jesus does as, <clears throat> as, uh, with the disciples is that he goes up in heaven in the cloud um, uh, covers him so so from 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 coming and he's going to come back the, the the two angels say he's going to come back the same way yeah so with clouds so what goes mean. up must come down right yes what goes up must come down like elijah yes, yes. well thank you professor uh after we finish can you give me just one minute uh when when i close down and uh, i just so this is the book in spanish La imaginación apocalyptic, which is which is not so imaginative, because uh, when you when you go in the in the English, apocalyptic imagination, which is the same thing, la imaginación, imagination apocalyptica, apocalyptic. So so this is the book. Uh, uh, you find the links down uh, on the notes of the video, uh, both for the Spanish and the English one. Uh, uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, th th thank you for your for your time, and thank you for your wisdom. And hopefully, we can do this again sometime in the future. Thank you.